you have to take risks as a brand. You've got to go out and do more than you should be doing or try more than you, you know, you have any business trying and then falling on your face and learning from it. You don't succeed or fail. You succeed or learn. I'm Carolyn Hadlock, Executive Creative Director at Young & Laramore, and this is The Beautiful Thinkers Project, a podcast where I ask founders, creators, leaders, and visionaries how they bring their ideas to life. As we enter these conversations with thinkers across disciplines like art, science, and business, we'll learn a little bit more about the practices and identifiers that create beautiful thinking, something defined so individually, but so universally recognizable. Welcome to The Beautiful Thinkers Project. This morning, I'm talking with John Maris, who is the CEO of Solo Stove, which is a beautifully designed line of wood-burning stoves and fire pits, um, and now they make a grill. And if you don't know Solo Stove, you must not be on Instagram. It's having a huge surge in demand right now. So welcome to the show this morning. Yeah, thanks, Carolyn. This is, uh, it's, it's just great to be here. I'm a huge fan of your product, and it's always interesting. They always say an overnight success takes about seven to eight years. So when I went back and I looked and saw that the brothers actually founded the company in 2011. That's right. Yep. Spencer and Jeff um, are brothers, and uh, they fell in love with e-commerce in the late 2000s. And um, started looking for products that they were passionate about um, in an industry that they were passionate about. They both grew up spending lots of time in the outdoors, camping and fishing. And so camping stoves kind of became a natural attractant to them as they thought about products that would would work well in that e space. And so they started with a very small kind of camping stove, 4.3 ounces designed for ultralight backpacking. It was an eight minute goal. Um, to boil water with twigs and leaves and sticks. So whatever you could find without having to pack in a fuel source, um, how fast could you boil water? And then from there, just develop this cult-like following around what they were doing and the beauty of the product. And more importantly, what the product was doing for people versus what the product was. You know, if you think about a camping stove, you think about something that's designed to boil water or cook food or do, you know, provide heat. But it was more than that. It was this device that was getting people, encouraging people to get outside, to make great memories with other people, to disconnect from technology for just a moment or for long periods of time. And so over time, people started connecting the Solo Stove brand with moments, with these really good moments that they were making in their life that they could look back on. And they were kind of synonymous. It was like, man, if you have solo stove, then you're having these good moments. And that's what led to the customers coming back and saying, gosh, you guys have got to come out with more products because every time you come out with something, I have more, more good moments. Yeah. And that's really been a focus for us at solo stove is around our product development is not thinking about the thing, but thinking about what the thing does and making sure that the products that we're releasing are helping more people have more good moments, whether in their backyard or in the back country. Oh, that's, yeah, it's, it's, such a, it's a, such a great remit. And as you said, it gave people who lived in urban spaces the opportunity to have that outdoor moment. Right, 100%. And that's, that's been a big turning point for us as a company. It started out with ultralight backpackers, and there's only so many people that love ultralight backpacking, right? Yeah. And then there's like, you know, another group of people that's a slightly larger audience that likes to day hike and, and day camp. And so then we kind of came out with a product that, that satisfied that group that was a larger stove. And then you got a larger audience, even more that is car camping. And so we made a larger one that really accommodated more of the car camping market. And then eventually we decided it wasn't just about camping what about those that are intimidated by camping, but want to have a campfire experience? And that's where the idea of the fire pit really took, took hold for us. And we realized that we could provide that people didn't have to pack up their car and plan a big trip. And, and that's, that was really the early part of 2017 when we launched the bonfire fire pit, which is still today our, our most popular seller. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you've been with the company three, four years? About three, yep. Coming up on three years now. 
And I read that you were kind of brought in to help with the growth. And I know that uh, it was already in its own right growing, but you could have had no idea how quickly it would grow. Talk a little bit about when you started and where you were hoping to take the company and then just what's uh, catapulted it really in the last year and how you're addressing growth in that way. Yeah, Spencer and Jeff are incredible. And honestly, at the time when I joined the company, I joined the company because of them. They they were fascinating to me. They were humble. They they were so passionate about what they were doing. Yet at the same time, they were super successful and had this thriving e-commerce business. I was um, the fifth employee, and it was it was interesting. You're you're spot on. I I couldn't have imagined the growth that we would experience, but I did believe in serious growth for the company. I knew, I knew that there was a lot of potential there. It was a matter of, of pulling it out. The first thing that I endeavored to do was to build a team. My background and history is such that I do a lot of that. I've done a lot of hiring and scaling teams to grow organizations. And so I joined and immediately got to work and started finding where are the biggest holes, where, where are the biggest gaps to fill and in terms of our people and started hiring. Today, about two and a half or three years later, we have 85 employees. So that was a huge undertaking to maintain the culture of the business and kind of the roots of who we are and still be able to hire that many people that fast has been a big, a big challenge, but also a big opportunity. And as we found the right people to fill those gaps, it's allowed us to scale the business so much faster than we would have otherwise. And most importantly, get more products into people's hands so that they can create those good moments that I was talking about earlier, um, knowing that every time we get a product into somebody's hands, they're making, they're making memories around the fire. Yeah, so you guys must have a pretty fast product development roadmap. Yeah, we do. We have a fantastic um, group of engineers on staff that are doing all of the, the designing and engineering of the product, rapid prototyping in-house. We work really hard to try to keep you know, costs down so that we can provide great premium products at affordable costs to the customer. And, and that's, that's ultimately our biggest driving goal is, is to be able to deliver that, that value. So we'll, we don't ever take pride in or ever endeavor to be the cheapest solution, but we do endeavor to have the best value product on the market. So maybe more expensive cost-wise, but it delivers more of something in exchange for that cost. Well, and it, it seems like the brand was really built through reviews. You guys have tons of reviews and uh, I imagine PR outreach because you've you got a lot going there, but you have a nice blend of just coverage. I mean, obviously from the camping sector and then now from just the lifestyle sector, but then also people, I mean, people rave about it. You just get five-star reviews just again and again and again. So, so I know Spencer and Jeff, design this and, and initially they were sort of seeking a passion that would match the e-commerce, but the design is so unique. Do either one of them have an engineering background? I mean, it's just beautiful. No, they, you know, they really approached it as what if we could find something that was out there that we could just make better. And, you know, I mean, the cylindrical stove isn't all that renowned in terms of, you know, camping stoves. Um, and this idea of secondary combustion and creating really hot fires with, with natural fuels is actually not new either. It's been around since World War II days. Um, huh. And they put those two things together and created this beautiful product. But yeah, no engineering background. Just they were in their garage tinkering with Folgers coffee cans. It seems like you guys have a, a rich culture. If you had to sort of describe the standard kind of characteristics that you look for in one of your employees and how you would define your culture? How would, how would you describe that? These are kind of the things that we're looking for when, when we bring new people in, people that are, that are always learning. So we always say that nobody likes a know-it-all. And, and at yeah. Solo Stove, we work really hard not to hire know-it-alls. You know, people that are just hungry for information that always feel like there's something else to learn. Um, we aspire to be better every day. And so we're constantly looking to create more good moments tomorrow than we, than we did today. And then delivering on expectations for our customers. Um, everybody, everybody has different expectations. Our goal is not to deliver the same level 
of service every time we interact with a customer or the same experience. Our goal is to figure out where is your expectation as a customer, and then we're going to meet or exceed that every time. And I, I was uh, reading some of the um, things on your LinkedIn profile and t- people talking about your leadership style, and it does seem like your style, your brand of leadership is very much open, direct, transparent, but also giving a lot of autonomy. So it feels like you're able to run pretty lean. 100%. You know, you hire good people to let them do their thing. And if you smother them, you never get the good out of them. And so I'm a big believer in autonomy. Uh, I am extremely direct. Um, I'm a very blunt leader. And so on the front end, I do my very best to make sure that the expectations are clear but I manage to output or outcome. I don't manage to process. Hmm. So you may have a different way of getting from point A to point B, but as long as you know about point B and you know where you're headed, then I believe that you can take your skill set and get me there. That is 100% how I work with my team. I do think there's a, a little bit of an explorer's mindset when you have these kinds of products that you know sort of have the DNA of starting in the outdoors and just um, giving people leeway to to work things through. Talk about just that crush of demand during the holidays and, and not being able to keep up and how you manage that gap with your people. Yeah, I think it's that it's that idea that any news is good news. And so we tried and, and listen, we were far from perfect. Um, I think that this holiday season was the most disappointing time for me personally, for our brand, because there were so many people, even, even with as hard as we, we tried to communicate well, we still missed the mark and we still over-promised and under-delivered in some instances. If one customer is having a bad experience, it, it's, it's disturbing to me and it, it makes me, it's what keeps me up at night for sure is knowing that we disappointed a customer and stress them out. Yeah. Our brand is supposed to create good moments. And so when it creates anything but a good moment, it's like the opposite. It's, it's worse. Like they would have been better off not interacting with our brand. And that scares me. But we did work really hard. We spent all of our time over the holidays, either all hands on deck dealing with customer service issues and just answering the phones. I remember one day coming in, and we had we have a team of 10 customer service agents. We had 18,000 tickets. I believe and it. And I remember it was just like email out to the entire company. Like all it didn't matter if you were in the warehouse, didn't matter if you were marketing, accounting, finance, like everybody's logging in today and we're gonna start, we're gonna start responding to customers. And it took us three days to go from 18,000 tickets to zero. But in that three-day period, you know, all 70, 80 employees at the time were just hammering through trying to help customers and and communicate with them. So I think bad news is still good news um, as long as you're being forthright and honest with with customers. And so that's what we try to do, even though sometimes it's hard to to deliver, you know, the disappointment. They talk about, especially CEOs, that there's two kinds of leaders, the leader in the peacetime and then the leader in the wartime. And you've kind of had both sides of the equation. You know, you've been in the trenches, but you've also been in the in the other side of it. Do you have any tips or secrets of leadership when when you're thinking about how to move forward in either one of those times? Yeah, I mean, listen, I, one of the things I think my team would say about my approach and style is I choose to lead with a glass half full. A lot of leaders feel like my job as a leader is to is to find the areas that need to be improved and really focus on those. And there's no doubt that that under my leadership style, we attack the issues, but we're always focused on the positive as we attack the negative. And I think that that's important for your team from a morale standpoint, yeah. as a reminder that you're doing a ton right, even though you're going to slip and fall. Actually, as a brand, any company, if you're not failing at something, then to me, you're not trying hard. You have to take risks as a brand. You've got to, you've got to go out and do more than you should be doing or try more than you, than you, you know, you have any business trying and, and then falling on your face and learning from it. You don't succeed or fail. You succeed or learn. Mm -hmm. That's a cultural element within solo stove that I believe in and that I really have pushed the rest of my leadership team 
to embody as, as a team. So I think focusing on the positive while not ignoring the negative and, um, and just having that mentality of succeed or learn, there is no fail is our, our two really good tips for, for anyone that's, that's trying to get a business off the ground or, or, you know, go from one to 10 million or whatever it is. Yeah, no, I, I love that. So if we talk about marketing for a second, where did the name Solo Stove come from? What's the origin story of that? Yeah, it's a good question. So um, in, at the beginning, the very beginning, it was the idea was that it was the last stove that you would ever own. Uh-huh. And That's awesome. so it was your Solo Stove. We never intended or thought there's going to be three sizes of this and there's going to be fire pits and so on and so forth. But actually the messaging holds that whether you own our entire suite or whether you own just one of our products, we hope that it's the last stove or the last fire pit that you own, that, that this is the brand that once you experience, you want to be a part of for life. Today, about 60% of our business is coming by word of mouth. That's high. That's powerful for a brand that's growing. It allows you to do some really special things as your customers help you to evangelize what you're about. As a brand who's used digital and social media to really scale and grow, what has been your approach to that and where do you see that going? Yeah, you know, our our belief, and this goes back to Spencer and Jeff, who were fascinated by e-commerce. If you can deliver value to customers, then they will give you their time and attention. And so whether it's Instagram and Facebook or whether it's Pinterest, or whether it's YouTube, or now TikTok, the content that we're putting out is intended to inspire and ignite something inside of people to deliver value so that when they think back to that ad, they go, that was that added value to my day or that added value to my life. It inspired me to get outside or inspired me to do something different. Social media has been a big one for us. It's easy to share because of that word of mouth factor, we found social media to be highly effective. But the truth is, is we will evolve over time as the platforms continue to evolve. Snapchat, TikTok, you know, there's this perception around those being really young audiences, but those demographics are starting to shift and you're starting to see an older demographic um, join those platforms. And Solo Stove, I think what you'll find with us is that we're just on the forefront of wherever we need to be. One of the challenges um, is how to correlate sales to engagement, you know, especially when you when your growth comes through social media platforms, it can be a little more challenging. Is there anything that you guys do to sort of assess a correlation between or is that not really a significant um, issue for you guys? Yeah, we measure everything. We make very calculated decisions around our digital our digital investments and it's all tied back to a return on ad spend Um, we don't do anything blindly and we typically say no to every opportunity that comes our way if they tell us that it can't be measured or this is more of a brand play yeah yep that makes sense and then you know just where we are this moment in time i mean with covid and we're coming up on almost a year now which is just boggles. I think everybody's Insane. everybody's Insane. mind. But I mean, obviously, that's been a huge uh, growth area for you guys, because it is allowing people to be together and outside. Have you heard any um, stories or anything, any anecdotes during this time that just stand out to, in your mind? You know, hundreds and hundreds. You talked about our, our reviews, you know, hundreds of thousands of reviews on our products. And, and it's great. I mean, we, we love the stories. Um, there's one in particular that I'm thinking of that just jumped to the top of my head right now as you asked the, the question. We, we came across an article we were featured in in the Seattle Times and newspaper where a neighborhood had was just sick of being inside and sick of not having human interaction. And this neighborhood coordinated an effort where they, you know, multiple neighbors purchased solo stoves and they went out into like a a large parking lot. I believe it was a church parking lot. And they set these solo stove fire pits out and they were all six feet apart, but there were like 
a hundred people from the neighborhood, all with their camp chairs, all with the solo stoves and the heat coming off of the solo stoves. And of course the very minimal smoke and just being able to have conversation with other humans. And I even think that there's something visceral about it, even on my phone, because I, when you see fire, it just sort of draws you in, you know, there is that kind of primal um, instinct. You know, I feel like we're all in this space right now where we are changing our routines and, and doing new things. But in a lot of ways, I call it positive regression. We're going back to spending time um, hiking and walking. And it's, it's one thing to be able to be with your family. And it's another thing, as you said, to have that moment around a fire, because there's just something about it that's just transportive and creates that sort of aura of quiet too, because a lot of times you'll see people not even talking. 100%. I think it's really interesting to see fire coming back around as this like gathering space for, for family and friends. Yeah, I, I, I love everything about that. The, that word primal, we use all the time at Solo Stove. It is extremely primal. You know, we get hundreds of photo submissions uh, on our site. Uh, on a weekly basis of customers that want to share a picture of their their fire. And there's something really special about your fire. I, I think it goes back to that primal nature, but it's just ability to create. Yeah. And there's something pretty special about creation in general and um, and to be able to create your own fire. So I love I love that primal theme and and the idea of positive regression. A hundred percent am a big believer in in that and what COVID has done in terms of positive regression for for society as a whole. And I know you guys recently launched your grill, and I thought it was so interesting. One of the things I was reading that it you designed it to be at height for people to sit around it and sort of co grill. Talk about that a little bit and how that came to be. Yeah, you know, customers were begging us for something to cook on. And we knew we wanted to do something, but we didn't want to do it like everybody else. You know, the grilling space is super crowded. It's pretty boring in our opinion. You know, everybody's doing it the same way. It's just got a different brand on it. You know, what it actually does, again, going back to what does this do? Like, forget about the object, but what is it intended to do? And the thought was, what if we could change people's behavior? What if it, what if the grill master didn't have to be all on their own? I have five children. When I'm grilling, I'm always by myself and the rest of the family is somewhere else swimming or doing this or doing that, especially in the summertime. My thought was like, what if my kids were sitting around the grill with me? What if my kids had a set of tongs in their hands? What if they grilled their own hot dog or burger Mm -hmm. and we all just sat around laughing and enjoying the moments together? That would be pretty cool. It's like Benny Hanna of the backyard is is what I started. I started coining that term internally. Um, you know, we've got our work cut out for us, people. It's not the way that people think about doing it right now, but we are big believers that once people experience it, it will be one of those things that you look back on and go, "How did we ever grill any other way?" And I think it's really cool to teach kids how to cook. Yeah, what you'll see in the future for Solo Stove is a lot of food content. Um, helping people just like we did with fires where it was like, you don't have to have ever started a fire. You don't have to be a camper to have a great bonfire in your backyard. If you've never grilled before, this doesn't need to be intimidating. We're going to make it super fast and easy for you yeah. and go have some fun and make good memories and, and create good moments with your family. I love that. So where are you, where are you hoping to take the company? Yeah. You know, we are, becoming better and better and closer and closer to being a household name. In a lot of ways, I, I look at our brand and what we've built. And I think, you know, we really are becoming the Yeti of the, the cold season. We have some international expansion uh, on the horizon that we're pretty excited about. Where we differ from Yeti is, is our beginnings. Yeti was a, a company that was very focused on getting into retailers. Yeah. Solo Stove has been a direct to consumer, a DTC, you know, solostove.com brand from day one. And we added some wholesale retail relationships much later in our progression. But today we're still the vast majority an e com brand. And because of that, we have direct access to our customers and to their feedback and to what they want and where they are, to your point. And that has allowed us to follow the customers and take the product where they are, which, which we believe has been a huge differentiator for us. Yeah, I do too. What are some other brands that you admire? 
Oh gosh. For, for a variety of reasons, um, you know, I've been reading lots of biographies of, of just founders of, of a variety of companies. You know, I've read Starbucks and, and Netflix and Apple and, you know, Apple's one that I've always had a huge admiration for because they, you know, this, this term, this, this coin term of think different mm-hmm. is really cool. Not think differently, which a lot of people kind of mistake. Like the term was all about thinking in a different way. No, it was like, think about the idea of different, like think about being different, think about the word different. And I, I love that because uh, I think that it can, it can force you down paths that you wouldn't otherwise go. Yeah. Um, Patagonia has been one that I've, I've admired, you know, they're, they're more causal based than solo stove is, or probably ever will be. But what I really admire about Patagonia is their commitment to that. I just love authenticity. I love brands that are authentic and, and they are who they are and they're unapologetic about it. And Patagonia is that way. So you don't have to agree with every stance that they make or you can, but at the end of the day, they make amazing products and they're unapologetic about what they're about. As you know, somebody who's worked in branding all my life, I do think that people, when used to look to institutions for that kind of leadership, you know, in, the, in our government, and I think there's so much divisiveness now, and even has been, you know, on and off throughout the years, that I do think brands do hold a higher responsibility for these types of issues and for society and, and being authentic. And, it, and it's a word. Authenticity gets bandied about a lot um, and abused a lot at the brand level in particular. But it's, it's so great to have some of those brands that are really living, walking the walk, you know? Yeah, 100%. My last question for you is I ask everybody who comes on the show, Unoya is beautiful thinking. That's what it means. And so I, I love to find out what people think their definition of beautiful thinking is. Not, not to be too cliche or, or repetitive here, but it's just this idea of, of authenticity, of being authentic. To me, it's beautiful when you're authentic um, and when you feel like you can be who you are and outwardly say what you think and being vulnerable enough to say what it is and then let the world determine whether it's beautiful or not. 100%. I like that. Well, thank you so much for this time um, and keep doing what you're doing because it's a beautiful product and and a really thriving brand. So well done. Thank you so much, Carolyn. It was great meeting with you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. I hope you found something that inspires you to think strange, different, new, and beautiful thoughts. This podcast was created and produced by Young & Laramore, an independent agency focused on helping national consumer brands take a stand. To explore more about today's conversation and all of the other thinkers I've spoken to, check out our blog, The Beautiful Thinkers Project, or follow us on Instagram, at The Beautiful Thinkers.